All right. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, welcome to our Thursday Fives at Fives with audio advice and clips. Thanks for tuning in. We see folks uh, from all over the country and even all over the world. So we're really excited that you guys are spending part of your uh, Thursday afternoon here on the East Coast. It's five o'clock. Uh, thanks for joining us right before the holiday weekend. Uh, here's what you can expect for the next hour. We're going to be talking about all things the fives. So Klipsch's high performance brand new powered speakers that launched just a couple of weeks ago back in June. Um, we had a great kickoff about a month ago. We had a lot of great questions. So we decided to do this again. In addition to talking about all things the fives, we're going to be giving away some really cool gear. Uh, if you've joined the audio advice June giveaway, we're going to be announcing the winner of our Klipsch fives. Uh, winner for the month of June. So stay tuned. We're going to be announcing that you can pick between either color. Uh, in addition to that, we're also going to be giving away another pair of the fives uh, our friends at Clips have provided based on the questions that you guys are submitting. So you guys can submit questions either via either platform, Facebook, YouTube. We can see those coming in. Uh, we're going to pick the best question and we're going to be giving away a pair uh, to the to the person who provides the best question over the next hour that we're gonna to try to get to. We're gonna to try to get to as many of those as possible. And lastly, a third giveaway that we're gonna be doing is for those of you who have purchased a pair of the fives over the last couple of weeks since they launched, we're gonna be giving away a great sub that will perfectly complement the, the Clips fives. So you've got a lot of great questions, a lot of great, great content, and of course, some really cool giveaways over the next hour that we're gonna to get to. So again, thanks again for joining us. We've got a great panel that I'm gonna introduce here. Several folks who are rejoining us and then some special guests that we wanna introduce. Uh, so again, don't forget to submit your questions below. and We're gonna to try to get to those. So uh, first, let me welcome back Leon Shaw. Leon is our founder and chairman at AudioVice. Leon, welcome. Tell us, I guess, first off, tell us what you're, uh, what you're drinking here today during our happy hour. I picked a local Raleigh beer my uh, kids got me for Father's Day. It's a Brewery Ravana Pithy IPA. There you go. Cool. And uh, Leon, you started Audio Advice a little over uh, 40 years ago, right? Back in 1978. Tell us a little about how you decided to come up with starting Audio Advice back then. Well, that's the story. So you guys ready for it? <laughs> yes. So in, in, uh, we went to Wake Forest University in the early 70s, really got into stereo then. I bought one mail order. It sounded terrible. So I started reading about how to make them sound better. So I became a campus rep selling stereos, degree, graduated with an economics degree, decided I didn't want to work for a bank. And I was <laughs> serious for a year to get it out of my system and then go to work for a bank, like all good economists did. And uh, came to Raleigh because there were 19 stereo stores and went to work for Sam Goodies. And uh, I noticed all the stores in town, including Sam Goody's, was if you go into them, they were just basically trying to sell you what they had in stock. They weren't really asking the person questions about what they really needed. And I always did that. And so I decided there's got to be a better way to do this where you actually find out about the person's room and about the other gear they have and what's best for their system. And that's what led me to start audio advice. And uh, it's been a blast. It's all about all I've ever done. And it's been a ton of fun. It, it is a, a ton of fun. So uh, audio, audio advice, obviously, we have two stores in Raleigh in Charlotte, North Carolina. So if you're uh, in one of those two locations or you're passing through on the way to the beach or the mountains, feel free to stop in on by. We obviously have the fives on display as well as uh, all of the Clips Heritage speakers uh, across both of our stores. And obviously, we have a nationwide e-commerce uh, website that we're really excited about. Uh, so if you need any help, we'd love to be your go-to go destination for all things uh, high performance home audio. We have uh, you know some of the most knowledgeable folks in the industry available for you, uh, whether it's via phone, email, chat. We offer uh, two day free shipping, uh, so we'd love for you guys to, to check us out. If you're not familiar with Audio Vice, you know please stop on by. So uh, Leon, one of the couple other quick questions: What was the first concert that you remember going to? Uh, your first concert? Oh man! Oh yeah! Three Dog Night. My dad took me, I was 12 years old. And I remember it was so loud. I sat there with my hands in my ears the whole time, but it was a great show. <laughs> and what was the last concert that you went to prior to uh, the, the shelter in place a couple months ago? Last live music or last big concert? Uh, either one. Last big concert, we took my uh, oldest daughter and her boyfriend down to Florida to see the Stones. It was an eight hour drive each direction but it was great. Was it worth it? Yep. Oh yeah. No oh. question. 
Awesome. I didn't have my hands over my ears then. I was liking it loud. What was, uh, so you were obviously one of the first in the country or maybe the first in the country uh, who was able to listen, listen to a pair of the fives outside of uh, the Clips organization. So what was the first track that you listened to on the fives and, and tell us a little, little bit about what stood out to you? Well, I actually had a play in the background first, not paying attention to anything, breaking them in. And that's when I was blown away by how good they sounded at low levels. But the first serious track is one I use a lot. And being a Stones fan, it's uh, you can't always get what you want. That starts out with a choir and it's got a French horn in the left hand channel. And if the system is really good, you can hear the trombone coming in on top of the French horn which I actually couldn't hear on the fives. I've never heard it on any speaker. It's only on headphones. <laughs> um, the spaciousness of that choir, the Mick Jagger's voice comes in and you hear all that. It was just, it was great. They were really something. So you've got a full written review. Obviously we'll link to it so everybody can take a look at that. If that's something they want to check out at audioadvice.com, we'll provide the link. And of course you can find the full video review on YouTube. I think we've got close to, I think maybe 50,000 views on that. So be sure to check that out as well. Um, Mike, thanks again for, for joining us as well. Same, you know, same yeah. question to you. First, tell us what it is that you're, uh, you're drinking during this happy hour. Oh, I'm drinking a, another local beer from Indianapolis. I don't know if you guys can see that. It's the six foot blonde from Quaff uh, right here in Indiana. So how is it? It's good. It's delicious. Well, uh, you, you were very popular last time. Obviously folks had a lot of questions and, and we're excited to see you back. So first, first yeah. concert that you remember going to. Man, uh, so this is funny. Leon, you're a Stones guy. The first concert I ever went to uh, was Paul McCartney. I was 10 years old, so we're, we're going to have to battle that out later, Leon. But, um, yeah, it was another, like, my dad kind of raised us on the Beatles, and uh, we went as a, as a family to see Paul McCartney. And he was old then. That was 30 years ago. What was the last show you saw prior to uh, the last show I saw was um, a Scottish band called We Were Promised Jetpacks. They were at a, a great uh, venue here. Yeah, Andrew, knows. Here. Was uh, a great awesome. venue here in Indy called the Hi Fi. Uh, and they put on a great show, and that was uh, just a couple weeks before all the all the nonsense hit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we are going to be coming back to you with uh, with quite a few questions. Obviously, you're. Uh, senior product manager with Clips and obviously very involved in the R&D of, of the five. So we're going to be coming back to you here shortly. Cool. A uh, couple of special guests that I think everyone's going to love hearing from Angie Robinson and Craig Woolard. So Angie, we'll come to you first. Uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us here today. Thank you. Tell us, uh, you obviously have the the YouTube channel Recovering Audiophile. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got that started and, and what it is that people can find when they go there? Uh, yeah. So I've been an AV journalist since I was 19. I, uh, I've been writing reviews and then, uh, what was it a little over a year ago, um, as a kind of a goof, my wife and I, or my now wife and I, we made a video called vinyl sucks as a, as a joke and it went viral. And, uh, so we kind of just kept at it and, oh, did you lose me? Looks no. like the video froze. I think we're all still getting the audio, but video. Okay. Sorry. I don't know what happened there. Hold on. That fix it? No. Um, anyway, sorry. Um, Andrew, why don't we do this? Why don't we go to Craig really quick if okay. you want to be back out and then jump right back in. Maybe we'll see if that fixes it, if, if that's cool. Oh, there we go. There we go. <clears throat> sorry about that. So yeah, we, we did Vinyl Sucks and went viral and we thought, oh, let's see what happens if we keep at it. And as we got to talking about it, I wanted to do reviews differently than how they'd been reported in print for at least the entirety of, of my career. I think that this hobby should be approachable and not elitist. So we tend to take an everyman sort of view um, of things. We talk about the performance and the livability of products and how we try and show them how they're actually implemented as opposed to, I think a lot of other channels like to talk about how things are in a perfect environment and we live in imperfect environments. We live in imperfect worlds. And frankly, we don't all have million dollar systems, even though maybe on chat rooms, we try and sound like we do. Yeah. And so we just take a real, a real world approach to the hobby and we try and include as many people as possible. And we talk about all things from super affordable all the way up to, you know, cost no object and, the whole recovering audio file 
kind of name came about because yeah, for like 20 years, I just kept chasing this dragon, like right around the corner, there was always something better. And I never really allowed myself to be happy. Um, Cause as soon as I would find something, then very next day I would start to question whether or not it was, you know, good enough. And so, yeah, I've gotten off the hamster wheel and <laughs> just try and enjoy myself. Great. Thanks for sharing that. You've got a, a great channel. I've definitely checked out quite a few myself. I've been following it uh, pretty closely. So uh, first, first same qu uh, question to you. First concert that you remember going to growing up? First concert that I remember going to was uh, Chicago at the Exarban Fairgrounds. Um, yeah, I got, uh, I got drugged to that. And then I think after that, it was Elton John, Elton John and Billy Joel. I saw them a couple of times together. Nice. What about the last one? Last one was ACL, I think. Austin, Austin City Limits uh, Music Festival, like a weekend deal. Yep. Um, it was supposed to be Keen, but that got canceled uh, right around the time that the shutdown started. Yeah. Right. I'd been waiting for Keen for like 10 years, and then it got canceled. Oh, man. <laughs> Leon, somebody left it in the comments. They said, laugh out loud. I'm working at a bank right now. So <laughs> show them some empathy. Go to a Spanish master. And uh, Craig Woolard, we are glad to have you. So we thought we'd bring someone who obviously also knows very much about music firsthand, uh, lead singer of, of the Embers. So thanks again for joining us. We're glad to have you today. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. So tell us, uh, for those of those listening who aren't familiar with the Embers, I guess tell us a little about the Embers and how you uh, how you guys got started. Embers started in 1958. Uh, I was a member of the Embers at that time. It's a little before my time. I joined in 1906. We became the official musical ambassadors for the state of North Carolina. We had a contract with Anheuser-Busch and played in um, Honolulu and San Francisco, Chicago, and New York for different Budweiser conventions and have worked, I guess, on an average of 240 dates per year. So yeah. when the uh, when the coronavirus crisis hit, you know, it slammed it shut. Uh, and I think my last gig was mid-March. Yeah, wow. And since then I have not, I have not gigged, but I got one coming up this Saturday. It's a 4th of July show, multi-band in outside Burlington, North Carolina at the Piedmont Dragway or Speedway. And it's going to be a drive-in affair where folks drive in, we're performing, they stay in their cars and they've got a low power AM transmitter. You know, we hope they stay in their cars. Right. We'll see. Yeah. Well, I know all of us are, uh, you know, looking forward to the days where we can get back out and enjoy live music. So. What uh, what is it that you're uh, you're drinking? First of all, I'm drinking a Hardywood Raspberry Stout from mm -hmm. Richmond, Virginia, because I couldn't get to the Steam Bell Brewery Tiramisu Stout from Richmond, Virginia. First, <laughs> so it'll be afterwards. Uh, Andrew, I think I forgot to ask you. What is it that you have? Uh, I am drinking my wife's agave old fashioned. Ooh, oh. Ooh. it's good. Nice. Um, Craig, first concert. Ray Charles. Uh, oh. His, oh, wow. Yeah, man, with his big band, I was in the ninth grade and some upper class musicians drove me over there. So, and the, the killer thing is before Ray came on, some guy I'd never heard of named Billy Preston. <laughs> came out for the first 30, 40 minutes and just killed it. And I remember saying to my, my pals that I was there with, I thought Ray Charles was blind. You know, <laughs> it's Craig, that's not Ray Charles. That's really impressive. So it was just killer, man. We stood around, waited for his, waited for him to sign our autographs. He finally came out, being escorted by his manager, and stuck out the piece of paper and the pen. Said, "Mr. Charles, would you just make a mark on this for me?" And his manager snatched it out of my hands and said, "Son, he's blind. I'll sign it for you." <laughs> Watch your signature. So that's my first concert. So uh, pretty cool story. I believe you were actually on the the live stream that we did about a month ago and heard us talking about the fives, and you were you were convinced to uh, to pick up a pair. So tell us about that experience and maybe what it was like the first time. What what compelled you to purchase them, 
And then uh, secondly, what really stood out to you when you first listened to them and maybe what track you listened to as you, as you heard them for the first time? Well, actually, the first thing that forced me to take a look was, Liana, I heard that you had said these are special. And um, Leon is, is one of those guys that around here, you know, it's like uh, it's like the brokerage. You know, when Leon, when E.F. Hutton talks, everybody listens. And when Leon says something, you actually, hey, well, this must be worth listening to. So uh, I'm, I'm telling you, man, they're phenomenal speakers. I, I can't help but go back to my days of, you know, the six foot tall audio rack with receiver, amp, equalizer, et cetera, et cetera, and the giant speakers, and thinking to myself, man, if somebody had had this, this quality of sound out of this tiny little speaker, it, uh, so, I, I mean, really, I'm in a rave thing about them. I can't say enough about how, how much I like these speakers. Uh, one of my tests for speakers is to put on the Nightfly by Donald Fagan, and <laughs> When you go to uh, IGY, there's a line in there where Fagan sings, they say you like Brubeck. I like him. I like your eyes, too. And uh, right after he says Brubeck, off to the right channel, you can hear him or somebody going, uh, Brubeck, Brubeck, like a muted trumpet. You can't hear it on anything. You can hear it on these. So that's one of the best recommendations I can give. It's a great speech. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. It's really cool to hear someone firsthand. Uh, and Andrew, I guess you, you, you've you got a pair now. So tell us, what was the uh, maybe the first track that you listened to as you tested them out and what stood out to you? Uh, well, actually, the first thing that I ever heard through them was my own voice because the first place they went was on my desk. And so I was in the middle of mixing an episode. Um, and they replaced another pair of powered speakers. And then shortly thereafter, I was kind of like, whoa, you know, that's, they're way smaller than my other powered monitors and they were putting out way more output. So then I went over to Tidal and uh, threw on weekend, the weekends, I feel it coming, the, the Daft Punk uh, one and master quality. And wow, my wife came in from across the house um, and she was like, is that the new little you know, bookshelves. I'm like, yeah, and she's just like, holy crap. The base out of those things is enormous. And I, I said, yeah, I don't think that I've ever encountered a power speaker with a four and some inch base mid range woofer that can extend that low. Um, so then after that, we immediately disconnected them from my office and brought them out here into the main room and fired them up with the TV. And I don't know, we watched six underground on Netflix through them. We watched, uh, We've just been throwing everything but the kitchen sink at them and trying to trying to get them to break. So awesome, awesome! Thanks for sharing that. If you guys have you know first concert that you want to share that you think is interesting, you guys can obviously see the, the comments below. Uh, or if there's a great track that you recommend when someone wants to hear uh, test out a brand new pair of speakers for the first time, you know, put those in the comments as well. So, um, Mike, tell us a little bit about more. We had several questions Man. from the last. Uh, happy hour that we had, and then we'll get to a lot of the questions that are being submitted right now, which is great. We appreciate you guys throw us, throwing those out there. So some people obviously talked about the the base in the fives, obviously yeah. by themselves, as you guys have, have certainly spoken to, they sound great. But if you're looking for a sub to go with the fives, uh, is that something that you think you need? And if so, what sub would you recommend that pairs well with those? Yeah, to, to Andrew and Craig's point, I mean, these go deep. They play very low and they play... Uh, they handle bass in a, in a way that's clean and a way that's dynamic. So for music, I, I saw this come up in the chat. Someone asked, do you need a sub for music? I haven't been using a sub uh, for music listening on these uh, just straight 2.0 or two channel. Uh, but you know, if you're, if you're using them with a, a TV, which I'm also doing, uh, absolutely feel free to hook up a sub and it will just, It'll make those, uh, you know, 20 to 30 hertz tones come come through all the better. Andrew, you got a question? Yeah. With respect to the sub, I think it does depend on the size of your room. Sure. Oh, okay, sure. If I mean, I envision people that might be putting these in smaller rooms, yeah. smaller to medium rooms. Um, 
in an open concept room like we have, maybe a sub is required. But if you're in a one bedroom apartment or something like that, I would maybe argue that a sub still isn't necessary unless yeah. you're just feeling crazy. Cool. And if you also can't pull them away from the wall, you're going to load that base up pretty, yeah. pretty solid. So, that, And that's how I've got them, too, just on either side of my media yeah. console. Uh, pretty, pretty close to the wall, but it's a, it's a pretty good sized room and it certainly holds its own or they hold their own, uh, low frequency wise. I would say if you're an audiophile geek like me, since they do have an active crossover, when you engage the sub, unlike a lot of powered speakers, yeah, mid range did open up when I added a sub a whole lot because you are taking that base load off the drivers, not having to reproduce the base. So for me, I thought they sounded even better from the mid range up with a sub engaged. Yep. Fair point. Yeah. But I'm the purest audiophile guy in this year. So I'm still chasing that elusive uh, perfect sound. Intro. Yeah, Le Leon's still on the hamster wheel. I, <laughs> so I, I agree with that very much, Leon. I think it's important that, um, that everybody knows as soon as you hook a sub up to these, they automatically know there's a sub connected to them and they move uh, that that high pass crossover point up uh, into the 80, 90 Hertz range. So to, to your point, Leon, it does open up a lot of that mid range. It does help with the overall output and dynamic range of those speakers. So uh, there's also a really neat technology we're using in these that we actually use in the R51 PM as well. It's called dynamic base EQ. Um, and, and actually I'm going to, Hey, Yep, I'm going to share some slides here, Jonathan, mm -hmm. because this is too cool to not illustrate. Um, there we go. Dynamic base EQ. Hang on one second here. Do you click share screen? How's that? There you go. Cool. You go. Cool. Oh, yeah, look at that. Okay, so dynamic base EQ. This is a DSP feature, meaning it's all done inside the speaker in the digital domain. But for those of you that aren't familiar with the Fletcher Munson, Fletcher Munson equal loudness curve, uh, these two guys, Fletcher and Munson, back around the turn of the century, uh, the, the last century, did a study where they um, essentially tested human hearing across the frequency band. And I don't wanna get too technical, but they found that humans are less sensitive to low frequencies. And that makes sense, right? Like we're used to running from predators. Uh, well, we aren't, but our, our long ago ancestors were. We are very in tune to when babies cry. You know, we want to make sure that we are caring for our young. So when babies cry, that's, uh, our ears are especially sensitive to that. So the Fletcher Munson equal loudness curve essentially says that humans don't hear low frequencies very well, uh, especially at lower listening levels. So what the dynamic bass EQ does, it actually boosts the low frequency response below about 80 hertz to match up with that sort of uh, equal loudness curve that we talked about. So even at lower listening levels, it gives you extremely rich, extremely dynamic bass Whereas with most passive speakers or even powered monitors that don't have this technology built into them, uh, when you're, especially at low listening levels, you get very thin sounding uh, playback, you get very um, uh, tinny, lackluster sound uh, at low listening levels or background listening levels. So it's important to, to keep that in mind. You can uh, turn this off. Leon, who's a traditionalist, probably turned it off. Um, so if you're if you're an audiophile, if you're a recovering audiophile, uh, then you might want to turn it off just so you have the uh, more pure sound of your source material. But I, it sounded better at low volumes with it on, though. Yeah, yeah, and I've I've got them turned, or I've got dynamic bass EQ turned on on mine as well. So again, very cool feature to have. What I guess several folks are asking us uh, about the design of the fives. Tell us yeah. a little bit about what went into the design. Man, can I share a screen again? <laughs> Go for it. Dude, I've got, oh, this is great. Uh, man, it's a, have we like teed these people up with these questions? Yeah. 
maybe. No, no, it was a, a, right from the stream here. I just, I essentially have a presentation that covers all of it. So just in case. So design tenants of the fives. And frankly, this can be thought of as a, a Klipsch design DNA um, uh, manifesto, for lack of a better word. But uh, Tony Martin, who's our head of industrial design, has done a ton of research in the last several years about uh, interior design trends, material trends, color trends. And I want to talk about uh, essentially how we've baked those trends down into a, a design that's still very Klipsch. So for one, this idea of perfection of form belying raw power. So Klipsch is a very technology forward uh, company. We want to show off the horn loaded technology. We want to show off the pure power that we put behind every product we do. But there is a, a portion of the public or uh, our customer base that still wants something beautiful that can live in their home as a piece of furniture. So the idea of, of perfection of form and material belying raw power is important to us because we don't want to hide that technology. We don't want to uh, sacrifice that performance for the sake of form or for the sake of design. And it's really about uh, amalgamating the two. Tactile materials guide that product journey. You know, we talked, uh, I was on a uh, live stream with some, some good guys uh, a few days ago. We were talking about knob feel, the idea of uh, the tactile uh, feedback that you get from a product, even if it's not a, a control knob or a, or a button, just the, the idea of a, a product being something you want to touch, you want to experience, uh, and having sort of premium materials, but but really tactile materials guiding that product journey. Craig's probably probably familiar with that product on the right uh, and probably on the left. And then finally, something that's timelessly and unapologetically American, just like Klipsch. You know, we talk about no bullshit. We want no bullshit in our design. Uh, we want something that speaks to sort of the American spirit of. Uh, what am I trying to say? Being proactive in uh, and, and frankly unapologetic in um, being being the best at what we do. It's really what we want uh, to build on that tradition of what we've been doing for the last 75 years uh, and not be shy about our craft. So that's really where, where it comes down to the fives on the design DNA side of it. I will say uh, the fives are actually uh, drawn from the, the heritage line. So acoustically and aesthetically, we have gone back in time to Paul Klipsch's original design 75 years ago and said, what is Paul doing acoustically? Or what was Paul doing acoustically? What was Paul doing aesthetically? And how can we work that into these design tenants? So you'll notice the real wood veneer on the cabinet. We apply real wood veneers on the cabinets of all of our heritage products. Uh, the sort of angular design, but still having a, a fairly soft uh, material, very similar to what we do on the heritage side. So uh, aesthetically with the real wood veneers, the matte painted uh, cabinet on the, the matte black version, but also these, I'll do this again. I've been doing this for like weeks and weeks now. But these real machined metal uh, uh, user interface knobs and rotary dials, we think that that's an important part of the Klipsch legacy, these, these very premium uh, high-end materials that we're using uh, that we've used for the last 75 years. And we don't, we don't see a need to change, uh, especially in a market of sort of black plastic boxes. Uh, we want something that you can be proud of and, and you come home to it every day and said, and say, man, that looks really cool. I'm very happy to have that. Yeah, they look great. Someone made a comment that uh, they said that their wife would even let them keep them in their uh, family room because of the way that they look. Yeah. So that's a compliment. Uh, yeah. tra transitioning just a little bit, uh, several, obviously we've, we've spoken quite a bit about how they sound from an audio perspective, uh, specifically with music and you know anybody jump in here. 
Uh, several people have asked, how do they sound? One of the one of the features is that you can uh, use them with your TV and stereo. So, uh, tell us a little bit more about how that works. And again, if there's a certain track that you watched while you were testing that out, what stood out? I I mean, I can tell you that for movie watching, even by themselves, whether you want to employ a sub or not, in most rooms, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised. They are incredibly full bodied. Um, considering that they don't have much larger of a footprint than, say, a large soundbar aimed at a 55 or 65 inch TV. I noticed someone else commented too about how the uh, HDMI ARC works with them. Um, it works really well. Uh, it's been flawless with our LGs. Um, it had a hiccup with Sony, but I think that's more of an issue with Sony than LG, as I agree. Yeah, they, they, for whatever reason, have ARC issues. Yeah. Um, we watched, uh, well, I have a whole video on like what home theater demo tracks to do, but lately um, there's a torture scene at the end of, not torture scene, but a torture test for systems at the end of Netflix's Six Underground uh, mm -hmm. when the military coup starts. And it's probably about 45, 45 seconds to a minute and a half and it's all over the map in terms of dynamics. And a lot of speakers will tap out during that sequence and within, within reason, you know, if you're trying not to hit 110 dB peaks with these, they, they really do hold their own quite, quite nicely. So I do see them as a legitimate option to people who may be in the market for a, a sound bar. So. Cool. Yeah. And that's, that's really where the, um, the use case intent of the fives came from, you know, there's, there's so much, uh, marketing towards power monitors are great for two channel listening. You know, we talk all the time about, uh, integrated DSP and allowing or, or using that technology to get as much low frequency extension, as much balance out of a little four and a half inch driver as we can, but there's, um, there really hasn't been, and this is absolutely the case. This is the first, uh, the first product, first powered monitor product uh, on the market with HDMI arc. There hasn't been a powered monitor two channel system that's really built to be a TV system as well. You know, yeah. they always had optical inputs, analog inputs. You know, some of them have phono, which this does as well. Uh, but HDMI arc just makes a much more seamless experience. A couple uh, of, oh, I'm sorry. With respect to ARC, I just noticed a couple of people were talking about some of the Sony settings. I did notice that with Sony, ARC defaults to an auto one or auto two. If you go into the menus and you change that to just PCM and you get rid of all their auto settings, it does function better. Um, it seems like the auto settings in the Sony TVs may be getting confused. So if you run across a television, um, if it has like an auto and you you tell it specifically what to do. Uh, I tend, I see that 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 helps with situations like this. And then yeah. someone else commented, "How does it sound without a dedicated center?" And that was one of the things that, in my review, that hasn't gone live yet. But the the dispersion, the center imaging characteristics of this particular speaker, never mind that they disappear orally, but the the center imaging is really strong. Cool. It is. It's amazing. Andrew, I found the same thing. You had to set the Sony the PCM out to get it to lock in well. Yeah. The LG doesn't have that problem, but the Sony, boy, you better tell the Sony exactly what to do. Otherwise, it gets confused. Uh, someone made the comment. They said, uh, real real men drink stout and porters, and then they buy the Cliff's <laughs> Five. A big shout out to you, Craig. Craig, from your perspective as a, as a professional musician, you know how do these sound compared maybe to other uh, pro monitors that you've used, and have you used them for that use case? Uh, I have them in my studio next to the monitors that I learned on, and uh, I learned on Genelec 1038s. So they're at least 20, 25 year old speakers. They are just great. I love those speakers. Some people say that they might be a little too flattering, you know, but you take that into consideration. So I have these beside the uh, General X, and um, I am in the process right now of, of becoming understanding of what they do and how to hear 
the fives like I know how to hear the 1038s. So it's just gonna it's just gonna take a little more experience with them. You know, time is everything. Less and less and less and come to other speakers. I think that they'll be absolutely as dependable as the 1038s are, as dependable as the Yamaha uh, speakers, uh, uh, NS10s, you know, industry standards. I don't know if these will be an industry standard to the industry, but they will be to me once I get to know them that well. Cool. And let me say one more thing. There's a, there are some companies that have um, speakers tower, stick PAs, really, you know, tower PAs for small entertainment. And it looks like that's going to be a, a coming thing here. And uh, I, I don't want to mention the petitions name here on Clips' deal. But if Clips could take what they've done in these fives and incorporate it into a small PA system, there would be no competition. <laughs> and so, you know, I hope you do it. I'll be first in line to buy it. It's quite a compliment for Ooh. sure. And that's a good compliment, Greg. We, uh, we have a couple uh, uh, rascally product managers and engineers that have been uh, trying to get that done for a, a little bit now. So we'll see. Yeah. Well, the, the only reason, the, let me add to that. In 1979, we had a, a guy come into our band, um, and he brought with him, uh, he spent a lot of money. He bought a Profit 5 synthesizer. Nice. He bought a uh, CP88 electric piano he bought I'm, I'm like, we had two tx816 modules with eight tx7 in each one and he showed up with this big speaker and it was called the clips heresy <laughs> yep. let, let me tell you what musicians would come out to see and mostly hear us just to hear that clips heresy so there's a long history of folks blowing people's minds. And yeah. I, this is right in line with it. If you want to hear the heresies, come to uh, one of our showrooms. We've, we've got them set up. We'd love for you guys to do a demo. Those uh, are our reference here. Yep. What, uh, Leon, maybe talk about your experience listening to them uh, with vinyl. Turntable set up. Uh, they have improved the photo stage a lot. Mike probably knows more about the technicalities. I just know it lets a whole, a whole lot more detail out than what was in the earlier versions. Yeah, yeah uh, one of the questions was obviously is a, is a photo included. So yeah, you obviously yeah, the photo is included, and it is much. Yeah. Um, but they they are true to vinyl. They sound very warm, very three dimensional. Uh, you just want to keep pulling out more records. So I'm very impressed. But Mike, I am curious. What did you guys do with the photo stage? How? What's the improvement? Um, yeah, it's just a very, we kind of started from the ground up from the 51 p.m. It's just an incredibly low noise, uh, high quality phono preamp. We knew that these were going to be in a, a different category than the, the 41 p.m.s or the 51 p.m. So we really wanted to approach it uh, like you were, you were buying an external phono preamp. It uh, just happened to be built in. Just it's 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 low noise, and it's uh, it's probably on par with a you know hundred to hundred fifty dollars separate phone of preamp. I'm guessing. Cool. And several people have asked, you know, how do these compare to you know some of the other powered speakers, the the sixes as well. Yeah. So maybe you can touch on that a little bit. Yeah. So there's actually a, a pretty vast difference between these and the and the sixes. So the sixes, um, great speakers. You know, I don't want to disparage the sixes at all because I, I like them a lot. Larger driver than the sixes. So they go about 10 hertz deeper, but the fives are actually more efficient. They're about four or five dB more efficient, uh, actually six dB more efficient than the sixes. So you're actually getting about double the loudness out from, uh, out from the fives than you are uh, from the sixes purely, which of course we all know a more efficient speaker uh, makes for a, a, uh, a cleaner speaker, less distortion obviously. So uh, yeah, there are um, acoustic benefits uh, even though we have a smaller driver. I'll also say you have universal 192 24-bit uh, decoding on these or playback on the fives. 
the sixes are 96 kilohertz. So 96, 24, and that's your limit. Uh, with these, no matter what your input is, whether it's USB, optical, HDMI, if your source is 192, 24, you're getting that 192, 24 playback on fives. And you, you actually don't have that on the sixes. And then of course, we talk about HDMI arc so much, we don't have HDMI arc uh, on the sixes. It's, it's purely uh, audio inputs, or I should say analog and, and uh, optical inputs on the sixes, whereas on the fives, they're much better tailored to be part of a, a TV system or a theater system. Awesome. Hey, let's do our first giveaway. You guys cool. ready that? Uh, so the first one that we're going to do, I'm going to share a couple of photos here. Whoa. Let's, uh, can you guys, are you guys able to see this? Yeah. We see. That's some yeah. inception stuff. Can you see the slides now? Yeah. Real time, uh, real time here. I'm trying to figure this out. So we got a couple of real life examples of the fives uh, that people have shared for those who have already purchased them. So, that, so Thomas said, I removed the old 5.1 surround system and don't miss it at all. The fives just flat out rock with crystal clear voice and instrumental projection. You get what you pay for. So thanks for submitting that. Cool. Uh, Michael said, I cannot express how much I love my new clips, the fives coming from a sound bar and a small subwoofer. My listening experience has vastly improved. Living in a hundred year old building with a little insulation, the base is ample enough to piss off my neighbors. That's why we see how much more pissed off they get when I add a sub. Lots of folks have asked, uh, can these piss off my neighbors? So yeah, definitely speaking to that. Not only are there a ton of ways to use these speakers, these always sound great no matter how I connect them with so many ways to use them. Hear great sound. The fives looked like a good bet. I'm glad I made the purchase. They sound awesome. Thanks Matt for submitting that. Uh, and our winner of a sub, and we are doing the R100 for the sub that I think will go perfectly with the fives is Christine. We will reach out to you. She said, I'm very impressed with the sound quality of these little speakers. Vocals are crisp and clean, no matter the volume. And they look great too, which is important to me. Setup was a breeze, even for an old lady like myself, they are just perfect. So thanks a lot for sharing that, uh, Christine. You are gonna be the lucky winner of our first giveaway, uh, Eclipse Subwoofer, which again, will go perfectly. And uh, just for fun, I know, Craig, you've mentioned your setup. So you sent in a photo that we want to share with everyone. Uh, and Andrew, you sent in a photo as well. So there you guys can see uh, Craig's setup uh, with his pro monitors right next to the fives uh, and, and, and Andrew's as well. So congratulations, Christine. We will be uh, reaching out to you uh, shortly. And we're congratulations on that. Sorry for that uh, little glitch there. Congratulations, so, Christine. That's awesome. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that up looks really pretty. That's great. Yeah, a couple, couple of more questions. Obviously, we've got a ton of questions, so keep them coming. We're going to get to as many as we can. We've got a, a little bit more, and then we're going to do our second giveaways here um, in, a, in just a little bit. So do these work with Alexa? They do not. So that's a very important uh, thing to call out. We wanted these to be, one, killer performance, so we wanted to spend money on the performance. We wanted these to be beautiful fit and finish, so we wanted to spend that money on the on the aesthetics. And frankly, every time you walk into, not that anyone's walking into a, a store anymore, but uh, anytime you walk into a retail store, anytime you buy a consumer electronics product uh, online at audioadvice.com, uh, generally there's some discount or some giveaway for an Alexa Dot or a Google Home Mini. And the pre see mine is going off right now. The prevalence of these things, uh, it's it's just getting out of hand. And frankly, these are such a good fit for a TV speaker. Everyone's had everyone has a uh, an AI device hooked up to a TV or even built into the TV nowadays. So we didn't really feel the need to clog your media console or your home theater with another. Uh, Wi-Fi paired device when you probably have a uh, a source going into these that already has that capability. Not to say that we wouldn't do that in the future, and we know that it is a uh, highly touted, uh, highly sought after feature, but uh, we wanted to focus on performance, fit and finish with these, and then again, just we didn't think a user would would really need one with the amount of um, Wi-Fi devices in the home these days. 
Got it. You guys, you following along? Any questions that are jumping out that you guys want to? Yeah. So I, I'm seeing a couple. Um, Ed Hanley asks, "Can I connect the fives directly to my turntable?" Yes. Uh, yep. Absolutely. Has that Phono preamp we were talking about? Uh, very high quality preamp. Uh, Ryan, do I have to be an audiophile to enjoy these? No. <laughs> no. An audiophile will not. appreciate them, but you certainly don't have to be one. Of course, if you want to become one, we would very much appreciate that, and we would welcome you into the fold. Well, I think there were some comments in, you know, that have been made about, hey, if I'm not an audiophile, but I'm a music enthusiast, you know, is this is this the right product for me? And I, I probably would admit that I fall into that category, right? I'm, I'm certainly very uh, passionate about music, but wouldn't necessarily consider myself an audiophile, but love. I've, I've obviously given these a listen quite a bit and, and absolutely love them. So uh, tell, some people asked about the cable one. There's there's a unique cable and, and how yes. long is the cable and, and are there some other alternatives coming down the road? So yeah, the cable is about 10 feet long. Uh, it, it is a um, uh, proprietary cable. It's a four conductor cable. It's not traditional speaker wire. And we did that because uh, both speakers are bi amped. So we're actually sending two channels of amplified signal over to the passive side. So we do need a four connector cable. We are getting Which ready is a huge deal. That's a huge deal. That's why okay. they sound. Yes. I, yeah, I don't want to minimize that. Thanks, Leon. It, it's absolutely a huge deal. Uh, part of the reason we're able to get such incredible output and such great extension out of these is because they are buying it. Um, your question about a, a, an alternative uh, cable, we are getting ready to introduce uh, cable extension. So if you do have uh, a, a space between the speakers of, of more than nine or 10 feet, you will have an option available. Uh, that's just an accessory that you can buy and connect to the existing cable just to make uh, your span that much longer. So keep an eye out for that. It'll be available at clips.com and audioadvice.com, of course. Can I write a note about that cable? Can you what? Can I say something about that cable? Yeah. It has nothing to do with the length, but the fact that it is, it's kind of a BNC style light connector mm -hmm. and that it locks in place is really a big deal. Um, by amping and all of that aside, a lot of the, a lot of powered loudspeakers that have everything in one cabinet and then kind of passively power the, uh, the other speaker, if you will, they rely on, you know, some pretty cheap lamp cord or they rely on say like an RCA style cable and the, the connections on those sometimes aren't always the best. So I actually really liked the kind of industrial locking pro audio style cable that came with this i thought it was a really nice touch and it just it's the little touches along with like the wood veneer and the tactile nature that you were talking about those are the little touches in my opinion that make the user experience so different from other powered speakers because i do i think that powered speakers like this are actually the future they're not they're not kitschy this is where we're going oh no question yep no um question. And it's going to come down to the user experience. It's going to come down to the tactile feel. Um, and so, yeah, the cables, the cables matter, but <laughs> maybe not from that standpoint, but from the standpoint of you, you feel like the money you have spent has gone to good use and has gone to the right things instead of getting a bunch of just thrown in junk. Yeah. Yeah. These are, so I don't know if you guys can see these, but these are the, uh, Sort of proprietary cables that you mentioned about ten feet, and again coming out with an extension down the road. Uh, you know, if you've yeah, got a feed in, so you can't connect them incorrectly. It's got a little slot. Yeah, and it them down. And, uh, there you go. But yeah, Craig's Genelex that he has as a reference, they're active as well. Yeah, they've got separate amps for the woofers and tweeters, and that's how these are. And that just is what makes them sound so wonderful. Uh, transition a little bit. Several people have asked about uh, Bluetooth. You know, related this yeah. to the audio files. You know, thinking that uh, Bluetooth maybe isn't quite up to the standard as being directly connected. But tell us a little bit about the the Bluetooth with these, how it works, and maybe how it compares to uh, some of the other source options. Yeah, yeah, good question. So we're actually using the the newest Bluetooth 5.0 chip, uh, and actually in that we are using AAC, which is sort of the the high res. Uh, uh, codec for iOS, 
uh, Apple products, iPads and iPhones. Uh, and we're also using AppDex HD, which is the newest uh, sort of high definition, high res codec for essentially all the other devices, Android devices. Um, and AppDex HD is a, a huge feature to have. So not only does the Bluetooth 5.0 chip give us a little bit better coverage or a little bit better connectivity, it also improves the battery life of the connected sources. So uh, much better than last generation Bluetooth. It's much more efficient data transfer. So your battery will actually last longer if you have a Bluetooth 5.0 enabled device. Uh, but not only do you have all of those uh, benefits of Bluetooth 5.0 with AAC and especially AppDex HD, you're getting a much more uh, high res listening experience. You know, we, we talk so much about um, CD quality sound and, and even what they're doing on Bluetooth now is so far above and beyond CD quality uh, that, that yeah, I think, uh, especially for the, the music uh, appreciation crowd, I should say, not the audiophiles, this is gonna be uh, head and shoulders above what you're used to in wireless Bluetooth streaming. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, let's listen to it. I had a, had a question. They said, can these be laid on the sides instead of upright? If so, will that impact the sound? So I was, I actually wanted to ask Craig about that. Craig, you using them as, as sort of near field monitors in a, a recording setup, are you, do you have them placed vertically or do you have them placed horizontally? They're vertically just like okay. my Jet Flex. Cool. Yeah. Um, it's just how I have them. Yeah, you, you absolutely can put them horizontally to answer the question. Uh, it is a 90 by 90 horn, so it's totally symmetric. The, really, the only reason I would uh, recommend with any speaker uh, to not put them horizontally is if it creates some sort of asymmetry uh, with the high frequency dispersion, which this obviously doesn't. So, yeah. I would... I tested them very briefly on their side. I didn't find the sound to change too much. One thing that I would caution people against, the bottom of these have a cork mat type uh, substance on the bottom for good purchase on a stand. They do. Um, that is obviously not on the sides. So if you are going to place them on a surface, I would recommend some type of isolation. Um, just you don't want to mess up the wood finish, uh, anything like that, but it also will kind of do the same thing that that is attempting to do. Um, and with the amount of bass output that these have, you'd want something that has a little tactile feel so they're not going to start to hmm. move around. Yeah, that's that's a really good point, Andrew. Yeah, great point. If, they, uh, if you rattle them off your desk, that's not covered under the warranty. <laughs> so keep that in mind. Someone did ask about warranty real quick, just so everybody's comfortable there. Yeah, uh, so warranty on the drivers themselves the essentially the acoustic portion is three years uh warranty on the amplifier is one year um i'm sorry real quick dan just wrote in can these be used in proximity to a gaming pc i had mine for a bit like right on either side of my imac and they work great cool so i don't that yep. that question. Yeah, great use case. I mean, one of the things that's so great about these speakers is just the, uh, you know, there's so many different ways that you can use them functionally wise, right? Um, well, how would you compare these to maybe uh, like a two channel setup, something like the RP600 or, uh, I'm sorry, the 600 yeah. or, uh, you know, with, with those? Yeah. <laughs> so do you have them, Andrew? Andrew, you, you take that one since you obviously <laughs> are very familiar. Yeah, no, we were uh, we were in the middle of reviewing the 600s and then these showed up and derailed everything. Um, look, the 600s are a special speaker. They really are. Um, the 600s will go and be as good as you want them to be in as much effort and work as you're willing to put into them. The 600s will play louder with more authority provided you have the right amplification for them in larger rooms. Um, and so... I don't consider these a replacement or equal, but if someone doesn't want to get too involved with needing to pick out the right electronics and worry about things like that, a lot of the guesswork has been taken out of the equation for you with the, you know, with these. And so as a result, you kind of only have to focus on maybe what do you want to listen to, which I think a lot of people is, I think that's really what they're looking for. 
um, you know, I know a couple of people in this chat have commented that, you know, if you're not an audio file, if you are an audio file and it's like, I, I really, I kind of hate that term. Sorry. Um, because there's no, there's no substitution or there's no excuse or getting around just a good product is a product. Good. Does it make you want to listen more? Does it make you want to use it? And I don't care if that product costs $10 or $10,000. It, it's all the same because you can spend all the money you want on separates and stacks and cables and this, and you can chase whatever the so-called high fire audio file ideal is. But if you don't ever want to use it or if it's too complicated or it's, it's, in, it's um, you know, threatening, that may not be the right word, but it doesn't matter then you didn't achieve anything. And the one thing that I like about the fives, the one thing that I like about our, th what is it? The threes, the all in one um, thing is it just, you want to use it. They're approachable. Yeah. There's something about them that feels familiar. And as a result, they get used. And you know what you enjoy? You enjoy the speaker that's playing. You really do. And you can sit there and try and compare things after the fact, but in the moment, the only speaker that you're enjoying is the one that's playing. And if this is the one that's playing, guess what? It's magic. Yeah. Yep. Very uh, well. A couple more quick questions. Believe it or not, we're, we're getting close to the hour. Uh, time's, time's flying by. So oh, who would be the um, ideal customer for, for these speakers? What's sort of the ideal use case? I know there's, they're uh, very flexible, but if you, who are these designed for in mind? Man. Uh, they are designed for someone that wants a better sounding solution than a sound bar. Uh, they're designed for someone that wants a, an easy to use, uh, high performance two channel system. They're designed for someone that wants to dig all their vinyl out of the attic and, and put it back on. Um, yeah. I can't and for anyone who just loves music. Yeah. I mean, that's what they are. They get you into the music. When you listen to these, your foot is tapping. <laughs> What's the ideal? Several people have asked Craig. Obviously, the the fives behind you. That was more just to so people could see those in the video. What's ideal spacing? You know, if you're getting a pair of fives, uh, I've always gone by the rule um, that as far as they are apart, it's an equilateral triangle for me to listen in a studio monitoring situation. So that's what I have. I agree. That's that's how I liked them too. Yeah, about equilateral. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else, Andrew, Mike, any other additional thoughts or maybe, you know, based on the uh, the environment of the room? Uh, uh, I, I just think for me, it's it's they if your room is on the larger side or you have an open concept, they're not going to do as well. But I think most people with moderate to moderate size rooms are going to be fine. Um, ours are in our main living room set up. We're about seven and a half feet or so apart and we sit about close to nine feet or so away. And, and we got great stereo imaging, especially with a little bit of toe in, but I found that they worked very well in the near field as a desktop uh, as well, provided that you have proper isolation. My, my desk happens to be glass topped. So that cork does help tamp down on the, on the potential for vibrations. And yeah, I wouldn't, I just, I don't think you need to be afraid of doing something wrong with these types of, these types of loudspeakers, I think they promote experimentation and that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Craig and Leon, like I would professionally and personally totally buy into the, the equilateral triangle. I mean, that's sort of uh, industry gospel at this point, but yeah, we're, we're in a similar position where we've got them uh, maybe like seven or eight feet apart, but we're a good, you know, 11 or 12 feet back from the, the TV and, yeah, still so you're, you're about a two, three ratio. The two three ratio still works too. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, towed in just a just a tad, especially with horn loaded speakers. You want a little bit of toe in to get that that optimal sound staging. Last technical question: Several people have asked uh, what brand of DAC chip is used in the fives. So Ooh. 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 Uh, I'm going to say that's a little bit of a secret sauce. All right, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, we. Uh, we don't like to give too much of that away. All right. Fair enough. Um, well, guys, this has been a ton of fun. Uh, I think this has been great. Obviously, tons of questions. We've, we've got enough to last at least another hour or more. So thanks to everyone who has uh, joined in and asked a ton of great questions. And we'll keep continue answering many, many more of them. 
Uh, I think some several folks asked about Craig's setup. We can post that on our Instagram. If you follow us yeah. uh, on Instagram, we'll show a photo of that as well as some of the other submissions that you guys can take a look at. So, uh, Mike, I'm gonna let you off the hook. Brittany took care of this one for you. So, and a big thanks to a lot of the folks behind the scenes. You guys can tell that there's a lot of folks behind the scenes uh, pushing all the right buttons. So this went off seamlessly. Uh, Taylor and Heather on our side, and, and Brittany and Jill on the on the clip side, and you know a number of other folks. So thanks for all their help. Uh, Brittany's winner for a pair of fives is Rafael Rodriguez, who was the, one of the folks who asked about the question about who these speakers were really designed for. Oh, yeah. uh, vinyl, soundbar, you know, just looking into getting into music or getting introduced to Klipsch. So uh, congratulations, Rafael Rodriguez. You are the winner of a brand new pair of fives. You can pick a pair uh, either color. Um, so congratulations. And then the winner for the June giveaway from Audio Advice. Uh, congratulations to Richard B in Florida. Congratulations, you are also the winner of a brand new pair of fives. We will reach out to you and get those shipped out to you right away. Uh, congratulations, this has been a lot of fun. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed this. The fives, you know, one of the products that we've been incredibly excited about launching and thanks to Klipsch for uh, picking us as their exclusive partner. And again, if you wanna learn more about audio, please check out audiovice.com. We have some of the most knowledgeable experts in the industry that are available, phone, chat, email. Uh, please check us out. Andrew, how can people find you if they want to continue to uh, learn more about some of the work that you're doing? Uh, we're on YouTube. You can find us on social media uh, at Recovering Audiophile on Instagram, uh, the robinsonbrand.com website, and then YouTube, of course. Our review of the fives is coming out on Sunday. Uh, Sunday, so check that out. You check that out. And Craig, how can people find more about the, uh, the Embers? You can go to theembersband.net on the World Wide Web, or you can find us on Facebook, or you can find Craig Woolard on Facebook. Awesome. And hopefully we can see you guys in person again sometime soon. So I think we're all eager to get back out there and enjoy some live music. Uh, thanks again, everyone. Enjoy a great holiday weekend and have a great July 4th. And we will see you again next time. And lastly, we're going to uh, put out the link to our new giveaway for the month of July. So be sure to check that out. We're going to be posting that now and you guys can join that. So thanks again, guys, and have a great weekend. Thanks, thanks guys. Everybody. Thanks, guys.